Welcome back, everyone, for our next session entitled, Who Will Write Our History? It's my pleasure to introduce our two panelists, Dr. Sam Casal, the Charles H. Northam Professor of History at Trinity College. Sam is a member of the museum's advisory committee for the Toby Family Holocaust Education Program which supports many of the Holocaust initiatives we do uh, through our education department and through the Institute. He was last here in 2018 when he presented at our symposium uh, regarding the Ringelblum archive that we're gonna hear a lot about. And we're gonna hear a lot about that through this interview that will be conducted by my former colleague, Dr. Jennifer Putnam. Jennifer has come back to us uh, after just recently leaving us for a posting at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. So. Thank you. <laughs> it's hard to be bitter when you get poached by one of the best. So uh, Jennifer joined us after she received her PhD from the University of London. Uh, she first came as a postdoctoral fellow with our DPAA partnership as our DPAA research partner fellow. Then she was promoted to research historian and a role that she served in uh, until departing where she worked with our ASU partnership, worked with our other fellows and our junior historians. And it's great to have her back. So ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Sam Casal and Dr. Jennifer Putnam. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for being here and thank you so much to the World War II Museum for having us. I'm delighted to be back and to be speaking with such a distinguished scholar today. Uh, we are talking about the Ringelblum Archive, um, also known as the Oneg Shabbos Archive, um, and this was a secret archive that was collected in the Warsaw Ghetto during the war years um, and buried and kept safe. So we have so many of these documents today that we wouldn't have otherwise. So I was hoping we could go back to the beginning and talk a little bit about Ringelblum and his early life and how he got into history and what was unique about his kind of history. Well, Emmanuel Ringelblum uh, was uh, born at a very particular time in European history. That is, he was, he was born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1900. And it, it then became part of Poland, so he grew up in uh, interwar Poland. Uh, he was Jewish, and Jews in interwar Poland were a large minority, but they were an unwanted minority. Uh, that is, many Poles believed that since we finally have our own nation state after a century of subjugation to other countries. Uh, we deserve to be the masters of our own house. And uh, there are too many cities where Jews are a majority. There are too many cities where Jews dominate the economic life. And so we would be very happy if the Jews packed up and left. And for Jewish young people, uh, this was a time where the future looked very, very bleak because th there were very few opportunities. Uh, and so Emanuel Ringelblum uh, chose to become a historian, uh, a scholar, a teacher, but he saw history uh, as a weapon. He saw the historian as a soldier. That is that you study history, not to get an academic job, because that was impossible. Uh, you publish historical books, not to further your career, because you had no career. But you uh, researched history, and you published uh, historical studies to uh, defend the Jews of Poland against charges that they were aliens that they were interlopers, that they were exploiters, that they didn't belong in Poland. Polish scholars were publishing historical works that tried to say that one of the reasons Poland lost its independence in the 18th century 
was because its economy was dominated by this alien element, the Jews. And so young Jewish historians like Emanuel Ringelblum tried to prove that the Jews were, uh, were the people who built the country. They worked as hard as the Poles. They had participated in the defense of Polish independence and they deserved equal rights. So history was a uh, weapon. Now, because Ringelblum didn't have a steady job, he had four different jobs, and it was very hard for him to find the time to do historical research. That said, he had a remarkable record. He published many, many books, many, many articles before the war. Uh, in the 1930s, he also became a community organizer. Uh, he helped organize lending societies, microcredit, financed by an American organization called the Joint Distribution Committee. Uh, as the economic pressure on Polish Jews increased, as there was more anti-Jewish violence, uh, the uh, purpose of these microcredit societies was not just to get Jews back on their feet if their store was wrecked in some riot, but to remind them that they were not alone that they were, not, they were not isolated. And another point that I have to mention is that Ringelblum was really uh, politically dedicated. He joined and was active in an extreme left-wing Jewish party called the Left Labor Zionist. Now, it's a, I'm not gonna get into the ins and outs of the ideology, it's very complicated. Uh, uh, suffice it to say that it was very uh, Marxist, it was Zionist, but it was Zionist in a very different way. It believed in a kind of a binational Jewish Arab state. Uh, and so Ringelblum found another mission to uh, devote his talents to reaching out to poor Jews, to working class Jews, going, uh, 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 setting up night schools. Uh, giving the working class who were working 12, 14 hours a day, uh, reaching out and giving them an education. Now, to make a long story short, on the eve of the war, Emanuel Ringelblum was a respected person, but nobody saw him as a leader. Nobody saw him as a major talent. Nobody saw him as somebody who was going to uh, do what he did. And what he did in World War II uh, underscores the, the, what, what people often say, that in times of war, it often happens that people that you think are the great leaders fail, and people who you don't expect anything from step up and become great. And this was the case of Emanuel Ringelblum. Uh, when the war came, he suddenly stepped up and he did amazing things. So I want to talk about that. At the outbreak of war, he's abroad, isn't he, with his work with the Joint Distribution Committee? Yeah, at the outbreak of the war, he was in Switzerland mm -hmm. uh, at the uh, World Zionist Congress. It was a very uh, sad Congress because not only had Great Britain announced that it was going to basically stop Jewish immigration to Palestine, and uh, end its commitment to the Zionist movement. That was bad enough, and it couldn't have come at a worse time. But uh, while they were meeting in Switzerland, news came that Stalin and Hitler signed a pact. And there's a picture of the delegates at the Congress at the moment that they heard that the Soviet Union and Germany signed a pact. They're sitting by their seats, they're glum, they're in a state of shock, and they know at that moment, at that second, that war is now inevitable. Now, the Polish delegation uh, had a decision to make. Do we try to stay in Switzerland or do we go back to Poland? For Emanuel Ringelblum, there was no hesitation. My place is, is in Poland. And uh, he, he returned to Poland by a roundabout way uh, he got to Warsaw after the war had started. The Germans were bombing the city, 
And uh, as he was going into Warsaw, the entire Jewish leadership of the city, along with the Polish leadership, was actually leaving Warsaw. They were going east. And Ringelblum said, well, my wife and son live in Warsaw. I have to be there. But he also believed that since everybody was leaving the city, it was in my place to be there and to organize relief, to organize soup kitchens, to organize help for the refugees, to organize help for bombed out people. Uh, he made this decision largely on his own. He didn't have to do any of this. And he said, this is where my place is. And this is a philosophy of his that comes up quite frequently because later when he is speaking to Rachel Auerbach, who becomes a very important part of the archive, he says something to her when she's trying to go to Lvov, doesn't he? Right. There's a, uh, uh, there's a woman, Rachel Auerbach, who's a Jewish journalist. She and Ringo Bloom were acquaintances but not close friends. And uh, she lived through the terrible siege of Warsaw in 1939, where about 50,000 people were killed and, and about 20% of Warsaw's buildings were uh, destroyed. And when the siege was over, she was packing her bags to go east. As you know, Poland was divided between Germany and the Soviet Union, and her hometown was in the Soviet zone. And just as she was about to leave, she gets a message that Ringo Bloom wants to see you. And she says, well, what could he want from me? And he sits her down and he says, look, not everybody has a right to leave. We need to stay here to help the desperate people who have been uh, uh, burned out of their homes. We have to organize relief. Uh, and I want you to stay. And I want you to set up a soup kitchen. Now, there's a backstory to all this, which is, as you say, the uh, Ringelblum, on the eve of the war, had been an employee of an American relief organization called the Joint Distribution Committee. The United States and Germany were not at war until Pearl Harbor. They were not at war until December 1941. That meant that from September 39 until December 41, uh, a, 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 a uh, a long time into the German occupation, American relief agencies could work legally in Poland. And uh, the Germans were quite happy to get American dollars at a rigged exchange rate. So this status gave Ringelblum and his colleagues uh, a cover uh, to start the secret archive. So the uh, the uh, legal work they did was relief, which was enormous. The soup kitchens, schools, refugee centers, daycare centers. Uh, but the same people who ran the relief organizations used that money and used the relief activities as camouflage for setting up a secret uh, archive that is they diverted some of the joint money for, to, to uh, pay the collaborators of the archive to get them jobs, to buy the paper, to buy the ink, uh, in order to get information about what was happening outside of Warsaw when refugees came into the city. Uh, they had to go through a, 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 a process where they were given uh, tickets for a soup kitchen, tickets for a refugee center, and they had to fill out long forms about their experiences, and they were interviewed. They thought those interviews were just to get the tickets and the chits, but those interviews were really to allow Ringelblum to have a file on what was going on in different towns. And ultimately, the archive collected more than 400 different files on different towns. Uh, so Auerbach was assigned to run one of the biggest soup kitchens in the Warsaw Ghetto, feeding 2,000 people a day. And then Ringo Bloom asked her to write an essay about the soup kitchen, which she did. And then after that, he drew her into the archive's work. And uh, I recently uh, uh, translated uh, Auerbach's memoirs of the Warsaw Ghetto, so they're now available in English. And I think they're a fascinating read. They really are, um, if you get the chance to uh, get it. I have it here. Actually, it's called 
Warsaw Testament, yeah. um, and it is just a, a fascinating read and uh, truly devastating. I mean, she gets into individual people that she knew and seeing them in the soup kitchen and seeing kind of the symptoms of malnutrition set in um, and, you know, the disappearing uh, Yiddish literary scene. Um, but I want to back it up a little bit to starting the archive. So how did this idea come about? And how did Ringelblum start recruiting people to be a part of the archive? Okay, he begins to keep a diary right away. In 1939, he's already keeping a uh, diary. And then in 1940, with the establishment of the Warsaw Ghetto, that happens in November 1940, where ultimately half a million Jews are herded into this uh, closed ghetto. Uh, Ringelblum believes that we have to record everything that's going on, not just for history, but for our own psychological well-being and for the future of the Jewish people. Uh, that if Jews don't write their own history, if they don't gather their own materials, our enemies will write our history for us. Now, this didn't begin with Emanuel Ringelblum. This tradition of, of using history as nation building starts in the 19th century. The problem that you have to remember is that Jews in Eastern Europe, there were millions of them, mostly speaking Yiddish, but they didn't have a country of their own. Uh, they didn't have any political power. And uh, because they didn't have a state, they didn't have police, they didn't uh, determine their own political fate, uh, they didn't have their own uh, official archives. And since very religious Jews didn't think history was important, you know, why is history important? We, we uh, know all we have to know about history. We were kicked out of the Holy Land because we sinned. We'll pray and we'll behave and we'll uh, be good and then God will, will allow us back in the Holy Land. So we don't need to study history. And uh, the, the, there were Jewish historians who basically said that without our own archives, without us writing about ourselves, uh, we are not going to be able to develop a literature, schools, a national consciousness. We will be stuck at a very primitive level of national development. So beginning in the 19th century, there was this push to uh, get Jews to write about their experiences, write about their towns, collect sources. This push was uh, stimulated by the terrible experiences of World War I. Now, because of the Holocaust, we forget what happened to Jews in World War I. But in World War I, uh, the Russian army expelled more than half a million Jews from their homes on the suspicion that they were spying for the German army. Uh, and then when the Russian Revolution happened and then the Russian Civil War, 100,000 Jews were killed in anti-Jewish rioting uh, on the pretext that Jews were communists, they were supporting the Bolsheviks or, or whatnot. So this was a time of unprecedented Jewish suffering. And Jews realized, who's going to write this down? 100,000 Jews have been killed in Ukraine. And who's going to gather the testimonies? Who's going to appear before a world court if a world court were to get organized someday? So you have this powerful movement to uh, organize testimony, to get witnesses, to send people to interview people who suffered. And uh, then in 1925, a uh, Yiddish historical institute, the YIVO, was formed in Vilna. Ringelblum was a prominent member. This was an interdisciplinary institute, historians, anthropologists, sociologists, all aiming to, to encourage Jews to know themselves, not in a religious way, but in a secular way. 
And uh, history played a very big part of that. So when the war started, Ringo Bloom was simply applying what he already knew. He didn't know that the war would last for five years. He didn't know that the Germans were going to murder everybody. The Germans didn't know that themselves in 1939. He, he, he was thinking in terms of just as we had to collect our own documentation in World War I, we now have to start doing it in World War II. And that gets me to another point about Ringo Bloom, which is that if Ringo Bloom had been a top rank famous historian, like say Isaac Schiffer or Meyer Balaban had, had been, it wouldn't have occurred to them to bring 60 people together in this project. But Ringo Bloom believed that the job of a historian is not just to write books with your name on it. The job of a historian is to help other people do history to organize, to take care of graduate students, to organize seminars, to put together bibliographies, to organize conferences, to go into little towns and tell people to get a camera and, uh, and uh, photograph the cemetery and talk to old people about what they remember. And because Ringo Bloom saw history as something that was wider than just research and publishing books, he was the one to organize this, this archive. And so they were doing this secretly, right? They had to stay under the radar and make sure this archive wasn't discovered. It had to be secret. It, it had to be secret, because if the Germans knew about it, they would have immediately arrested everybody and they would have destroyed the archive. And it's amazing that with 60 people, the secret was never disclosed. Now, they took great lengths to make sure it remained secret. First of all, they had a code name. They called the archive the Oynik Shabbos, the joy of the Sabbath. Uh, they were very careful in who they recruited, extremely careful. Uh, they tried as much as possible to keep a distance from the Jewish council, from the Judenrat. Mm -hmm. uh, they made sure that very few people knew where the documents were actually being taken. So there were only six people who knew where the documents were at any one time. And the problem with that, of course, is that it, it would have been all too easy for everybody to get killed and the, ar and the archive to be lost forever. A week before he was murdered by the Germans, uh, just before his arrest, Ringelblum wrote a final letter to one of his close friends, Adolf Berman. He said, if none of us survive the war, what will happen to the OS? And he had every reason to worry because by the time the war was over, of the 60 or so people that he had brought into the archive, there were only th th three survivors and only one, Hirschwasser, knew where the archive had been buried and he escaped by the very thinnest of margins, what's actually jumping from a train, taking him to, uh, to uh, Treblinka. And, but, but as time went on, it became all the more important to protect the archive because by late 1941, they were getting news about mass killings in Lithuania. Then, in February 1942, somebody appeared in the Warsaw Ghetto who'd escaped from Chelno, the first death camp to use gas. And they couldn't believe what they were hearing, that the Germans were murdering people in gas vans. And then in August 1942, five escapees from Treblinka appeared in the Warsaw Ghetto. And Ringelblum assigned Rachel Auerbach to interview one of these escapees, uh, Abraham Shapitsky, who'd been in Treblinka for 12 days. And uh, the record of that interview comes to more than 100 type pages. And then Ringelblum began to understand something else, that once, his, once before, uh, once uh, uh, he understood that none of them might survive, this might be the only record there would be from the Jewish point of view. We know today that Ringelblum's teacher, Isaac Schipper, who was murdered in Majdanek, 
said just before he was killed to another inmate who survived, he, he said this. What do we know about murdered peoples? All we know about murdered peoples is usually what their killers choose to say about them. The killers might write about them as they please, or the killers might choose to ignore them completely. Uh, and the Jews knew how the Germans would write about them as this accursed inferior race and so on. So Ringelblum said, okay, now that this is happening, we have to make sure that we bury those time capsules full of documents so that even if we don't survive the war, even if we don't live to see the liberation, someday those time capsules will surface and the world will remember us on the basis of our documents and not on the basis of German documents. Now, I chose for the title of, of my book on Ringelblum, uh, Who Will Write Our History? And I think that's the right title to choose. Would the Germans write the history or would the Jews write the history? Now think about this. Suppose the archive had never been found. And it was, as I just said, it was all too easy. It, 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 was, it, it, it was found only by the thinnest of margin. But suppose the archive had never been found. There were half a million Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto. There may be 15 to 20 scholarly books today about the life of those half a million Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto, culture, folklore, religion, self-help, resistance, and so on. None of those books could have appeared without the archive. Had the archive not been found, historians would have depended on German documents. They would have depended on survivor testimony, but that that's very different from real-time testimony. Uh, the victims of the Warsaw Ghetto would have been just that, victims. A mass of a half a million people murdered by the Germans without names, without a record, without identity. We wouldn't have known about the house committees, we wouldn't have known about the schools, we wouldn't have known about the libraries, we wouldn't have had the thousands of pages of the underground press, uh, none of this. And so, in a sense, the, uh, this archive became one of the most successful examples of cultural and spiritual resistance in history. Certainly, probably the single most successful example of cultural resistance in World War II. People saying, we're gonna die, and we know we're gonna die, but we're gonna leave a record so that the Germans will not decide how we're remembered. We're gonna leave a record so that people will at least remember our names. On August 3rd, 1942, the 10th day of the great deportation from the Warsaw Ghetto. Every day, the Germans were deporting 7,000 Jews to Treblinka, held by the Jewish police who thought that by uh, handing over five or seven people a day per policeman, they were saving their own skin. But on August 3rd, Ringelblum ordered uh, th that all the documents they had so far just get buried. And there was a group of th three people, a school teacher, Israel Lichtenstein, and two 17-year-old kids, uh, David Graeber and Nochum Agzivach. And they were taking all these papers and all the photographs, all the stuff that they had collected for two years, and they were stuffing it into tin boxes. 100,000 Jews had already been taken to Treblinka. These people didn't know if they'd be alive the next day. The Germans were only 50 yards away. They could hear them shouting, and they were uh, preparing to bury these boxes under the basement of a school building on Novolipki 68. And as they filled each box, these guys, the teacher and the two teenage boys, wrote their last wills and testaments. And uh, those last wills and testaments all survived. They were all found when that first cache of the archive was found in 1946. And the teacher, Israel Lichtenstein, writes, I've given my whole life to the archive. 
Uh, I don't want to be praised, but I want to be remembered. I want my wife to be remembered. Her name is Gela Sexton. She's an artist. She designed sets for the children's theater in the ghetto. I want our little daughter, Marguerite, to be remembered. She's 20 months old, but she equals four-year-olds in intelligence. Uh, I believe that this art suffering will be a... Uh, a redeeming sacrifice for the Jewish people. The Jewish people will survive. Now, Lichtenstein did not survive. His daughter and wife didn't survive. But what, is, but what do those last wills and testaments tell us? On the one hand, they knew they were part of a collective. They were, they were part of a Jewish nation in Europe. But on the other hand, it was so important for them that you remembered their names that you remembered who they were. You remembered that his name was Israel Lichtenstein. His wife's name was Gala Sexton. They had a little girl named Marguerite. What Marguerite might have become, those boys wrote similar testaments. And one of, this underscores one of the great features of the archive, which is the intertwining of the individual and the collective. On the one hand, we're part of a collective, a collective that's doomed to death. But on the other hand, we're still people. And we don't want to be forgotten. And kind of jumping off of that, I think what's really important as well is to think about the archives connection to the ghetto as a whole. Because it's not only documenting the society, but it has some influence in it as well. And so I want to ask you, these documents that they created in these interviews that they did with people who had survived and escaped from Treblinka and Helmno, how did they disseminate that information and did it have any bearing on the later Warsaw Ghetto Uprising? Yeah, well, it was important to disseminate the uh, information. The problem was that even when the information was coming out, people didn't want to believe it. Uh, but, in the course of 1942, the uh, Emanuel Ringelblum and the other leaders of the archive uh, were able, using the good offices of the Polish Socialist Party and the Jewish Bund, which was close to the Polish Socialists, they were able to send four detailed reports by couriers to London, to the Polish government in exile. And the last report was sent in November 1942. That last report incorporated a lot of Szepitsky's eyewitness testimony of Treblinka, including a map of Treblinka. So you had a report with a map of Treblinka uh, reaching London at a time when 10,000 people a day were being gassed in real time in that death camp. So all those reports reached London and they were all sent to the American government and to the British government. Now, the courier who took the last report, Jan Karski, uh, something very, you've probably heard of him, but something very interesting happened when he was in Washington, D.C. This was in March 1943. Uh, before Karski left Poland, uh, he went to the Warsaw Ghetto, which by this time was greatly uh, uh, diminished. There are only 60,000 Jews left there. And he also went to the Belgets death camp. He didn't get inside the death camp, but he got to the perimeter. And then he went to London and then to Washington. In March 1943, he's having dinner in D.C. with Jan Czechanowski, the Polish ambassador to the United States, and Justice Felix Frankfurter of the Supreme Court. And he's telling Justice Frankfurter uh, that the Nazis are committing terrible atrocities in Poland and that they've murdered millions of Polish Jews and that there are death factories in Poland, Treblinka, Belzec, Sabibor, where uh, Jews are being gassed and then burned. And Justice Frankfurter looked at Karski and said, I don't believe you. Now, Czechanowski, the Polish ambassador, 
was very upset. He said, you know, this man has risked his life. This man is an honorable man. I do not accept that you imply that he's a liar. And Justice Frankfurter replied, I'm not saying he's a liar. I'm saying I don't believe him. Now think about that. There's a subtle difference here. That is that in 1943, a Supreme Court justice could not wrap his head around the fact that in Europe in 1942, a cultured advanced state was killing millions of people in industrial death factories. He didn't want to believe it. And in fact, if you look at the record of our own public's reaction to the Holocaust, even though all the facts were there in the press by 1942, it was only when American and British troops came upon the camps, and not really the death camps, but it was only when they came upon the camps that the reality really sunk in and the American people really began to understand what was going on. But Ringelblum felt that this, of course, disseminating the information was a vitally important responsibility. Now, it's obvious that, in a sense, the agendas of the archive evolved over time. Uh, the, be the first agenda was to collect stuff. They collected essays. They collected uh, the menus from the fancy restaurants in the ghetto. There were fancy restaurants where policemen and collaborators and businessmen could spend their cash because if you had cash in the Warsaw ghetto, you weren't going to buy a treasury bond or you weren't going to put it in a bank. You had to spend it. So there were restaurants. Uh, there were theater posters. Ringelblum wanted people to know what life was like. But he still thought most of the Jews would survive. Then in 1941, the archive uh, decided that they would study Jewish life under German occupation, 80 different topics, women, corruption, children, education, Polish-Jewish relations. And this was scheduled to be a book of 1,600 pages. And each topic had a team leader, bullet points, interviews. Again, they thought they were going to survive the war, and this knowledge would help the Jews figure who they were when the war was over. In 42, they realized that the Germans intended to kill them all. And then the agenda item changed to document the mass murder and to alert the world. Now, a lot of the material was not found, and a lot of the material was lost. Water seepage in the tin cans. Uh, they took thousands of photographs. Only 70 survived. Yet the material that survived, the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw has just published it all in 36 fat volumes. Uh, so it's an enormous amount of stuff. And uh, it has enabled Holocaust researchers and historians to uh, publish all kinds of very, very important, uh, all kinds of very important studies. And it, it really vindicates uh, Ringelblum's efforts to make sure that this be safe and, and that this come to us. Well, and I think to kind of underscore the point of how much material they collected. This is, I mean, that's 36 volumes with one cache missing. They buried three caches right. and only two were discovered after the war. Yeah, that's an interesting story. They buried the first cache in August 1942, as I said. And again, nobody knew if they'd be alive the next day. The 60 people of the archive, every day somebody was taken away. The 60 became 50, 40, 30. Ringelblum himself, you could sense, was on the verge of a nervous breakdown that summer. He was torn between his loyalty to his wife and kid, i.e., I'm a dad, let's go into hiding, let's save our own skin, and his sense of obligation to his co-workers in uh, the archive. Now, the... There was a pause in the deportation in September 1942. Uh, so 60,000 Jews were still alive. Over 300,000 had been sent to uh, Treblinka. And 
only, quote unquote, only 100,000 Jews had died of typhus or starvation in the Warsaw Ghetto. During that pause, the work of the archive continued, and they buried a second cache in February 1943 in milk cans, two big milk cans. The milk cans protected the documents much better. Now, according to Hirsch Wasser, that one survivor who knew where the archive had been concealed, a week before the outbreak of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, they buried a third cache under the brush maker shop. That was the scene of heavy fighting during the Battle of the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, well, in December 1950, Polish construction workers came across the two aluminum milk cans. When they found the first cache in 1946, Wasser said, keep looking, keep looking. We buried a lot more, but they couldn't find any more. Then Poland became a Stalinist dictatorship. Hirsch Wasser and Rachel Auerbach left for Israel, and they thought most of the archive had still been lost. And then in December 1950, Polish construction workers who were building new apartment buildings on the ruins of the former ghetto come across these two milk cans. And their eyes light up. Well, OK, maybe there's gold here, dollars, jewels. And they see papers. It's stuffed with papers. They're going to junk it. But then the foreman comes back from his lunch break and says, no, you can't throw this away. We have to give this to the Jewish Historical Institute. So that's how that survived. Now, Wasser said there was a third cache buried a week before the ghetto uprising. After the war, he looks for that cache, but he couldn't find anything beyond a half-burned diary. Over time, that site became the site of the Chinese embassy in Poland. About 20 years ago, the Chinese allowed some Israeli searchers to dig on the site of their embassy, but they couldn't find anything. And then in 2015, 2016, uh, Professor Richard Freund, appeared with all these high-tech gadgets, and uh, he was going to ask the Chinese to let him renew the search. But by that time, of course, our relations with China were not that good. The Chinese were suspicious of all the high-tech gadgets, and unfortunately, my friend Richard Freund passed away. So is there a third cache buried under the Chinese embassy in Warsaw? Some people say there is. I'm not sure about that, but anyway, there it is. Well, I want to say thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to turn it over for questions. Thank you, Sam and Jennifer. We're going to go with the first question all the way in the back to your right, please. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, there's been a great debate historically about the relations between Polish Gentiles and Jews during the Second World War in the, in the Warsaw Ghetto, the role of Zagota, the Blue Police, all those things. What's your perception of that issue stemming out of your research and knowledge of um, that period? And then a second question is, um, there's been a great renaissance of interest in Poland today in Poland's Jewish history. Um, do you find that it's a history without Jews do you find some irony in how Poland has embraced this part of its history, even though it's totally disappeared? OK, I mean, either of those questions would require a one-hour lecture. <laughs> I've, I've actually written a lot about that. I, I, I also spent six years um, part of the team that put together the new Museum of Polish Jewish History in Warsaw. Now. The issue of Polish-Jewish relations in the Second World War is an extremely complicated issue. Now, I, I use the term complicated not as a cop-out, uh, but just to show you that uh, it, it, it's, it, 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 there are layers upon layers upon layers of complexity. For example, in, in Belgium or, or in uh, the Netherlands, uh, the people who would hand Jews over uh, to the Nazis were usually Nazi collaborators. Uh, 
in, in Poland, people who would hand Jews over were very often heroic Polish resistance fighters who would hand the Jew over today and risk his life fighting the Germans uh, tomorrow. So in other words, the black and white distinctions don't apply in Poland. Now let me preface anything I say by beginning and saying that the Poles suffered terribly in World War II. Uh, they were occupied by the Soviets. The Soviets deported uh, almost half a million Polish citizens. They did all they could to murder the Polish intelligentsia, including the, the 17,000 officers. Uh, the Germans, of course, were also determined to destroy the Polish intelligentsia. A quarter of Poland's Catholic priests were killed. Uh, during the Polish uprising of 1944, 200,000 Poles were murdered. So let me get that on the table. That is, the, it, it is, it is not correct to say that the Poles were collaborators, that they worked hand in glove with the Germans and, and, and so on. But that said, the problem was that Polish-Jewish relations on the eve of World War II were not good. They were not good. Uh, many Poles, even decent people who would have defined themselves as democratic and uh, humane, said our country has too many Jews. The Jews are 10% of the population. Some cities are 80% Jewish. And we have to encourage these people to get out. Now, when the Germans began to persecute the Jews, putting them into ghettos, and then, of course, killing them, uh, many Poles found themselves in a very, I don't even have the word for it, a very complicated situation, where on the one hand, people said, well, as a decent Christian, I'm appalled by the methods that the Germans are using. We would never do this. On the other hand, if a town is 80% Jewish and then the Jews are suddenly gone, all of a sudden houses, businesses open up. And if you don't take advantage of that, your neighbor is going to take advantage of that. So as a matter of course, the elimination of the Jews benefited many Poles. Now, there were Polish nationalists who said, well, we don't like the methods, but thank God Hitler is solving our problem for us. We never could have done this. Now, to make matters more complicated, the woman who organized the first Polish committee to help Jews, and this committee was organized in September 1942, uh, uh, Szczutska Kosak, uh, she said that as a Catholic, we have a religious obligation to help Jews who are being murdered. We have to do all we can to save them. She was a rabid anti-Semite. She said that all the Jews we save, I hope to the bottom of my heart that they leave after the war because they're aliens and parasites and we don't want them here. But as a Catholic... I cannot stand by while innocent people are, 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 are being killed. So that's another level of complication. So now there are two extreme stories. On the one hand, you have this extreme story that the Germans surrounded the Warsaw Ghetto with big walls because millions of Poles were risking their lives to get into the Warsaw Ghetto to help Jews, right? And that the whole Polish people was ready to help the Jews. No, no, that's wrong. On, on the other hand, Jews will say, including, you know, my parents are Holocaust survivors. Most Holocaust survivors from Poland did not like Poles. Holocaust survivors would say the Poles were happy to see us get killed. That's not exactly true either. But that said, if you look at the recent scholarship, Jan Gross, Neighbors, 2000, Jan Grabowski, Basha Engelking, what you see, an unmistakable uh, trend. The trend is 
that whereas for many, many years, many Poles said, well, we didn't like the Jews so much, but unlike the Ukrainians or the Lithuanians, we didn't get our hands dirty. We didn't actually kill Jews. Jan Gross showed in Neighbors in 2000 that, yes, there was a mass killing in Yedvabna by Polish neighbors without German supervision. And lately, other scholars have shown that up to 200,000 Jews tried to escape death during Operation Reinhardt by jumping from trains, by going into hiding, by going into forests. Only a tiny number survived the war. The vast majority were killed, not because the Germans found them, because the Germans didn't have the manpower. They were killed because of denunciations by Poles or because of uh, direct killing uh, 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 by, by their Polish neighbors. So it's a very complicated story. Poles who were caught helping Jews were murdered by the Germans. There's the death penalty. We know that 750 Poles were executed for helping Jews, perhaps more. Someone who risked his life to help my mother survive the war was recognized as a righteous Gentile. So. I hope that I didn't satisfy you with my answer, be <laughs> because I hope that my answer conveyed the uh, devilish complexity of this whole issue. Yeah. I'm going to go all the way in the back with Connie in the center aisle. Thank, thank you very much for a very powerful and important presentation. Um, a couple of simple questions. Um, you've mentioned the different caches and the, 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 the archives being moved. Uh, what, how, what's, the, in sort of, what's the volume of the archives? Like you, if you were to put the archive in a, in a modern archive box, how many boxes would that represent? Uh, second quick question is, all the documents are in Yiddish or some in Polish? Um, and lastly, where, where are the documents now? Okay, 50% of the documents are in Polish, 45% are in Yiddish, 5% are in other languages. The originals of the documents are in the Warsaw Jewish Historical Institute, but there are copies at the Holocaust Museum in Washington and at Yad Vashem. And the first question? What? How, how big is it? So how big is the archive? How many boxes does it take up today? Well, as I said, it, it's... It, that, that, in terms of meters and square footage, I can't answer that, but it's 36 volumes. Uh, there are about 35,000 usable documents that, that can be read. There are many other thousands that were rendered illegible by water seepage or, or perhaps are still buried. To your left in the front, please. Thank you for this uh, important presentation. Um, I have a comment and a question at the same time. Thank you for the non-satisfying response, by the way. That's very nice of you to, to put in words that way. Um, I've read a long time ago a book by Julius Margolin, who was a Polish Zionist who immigrated before the war to Israel. And he came back to Poland in vacation, unfortunately, uh, in uh, late August 1939. So he was trapped and then deported by the Soviets, so the other side of the yeah. border you mentioned earlier. And you, um, something um, impressed me a lot. He wrote in his book that uh, despite the very bad Polish-Jewish relationship before the war, the Soviets made him more a Polish citizen in, within three weeks than the 20 years of uh, kind of authoritarian dictatorship, Polish government. Do you think it's uh, kind of true? W what can you comment on that about the very complex, about the complexity of the Polish-Jewish relationship? Making it mushy, so I can Oh, sorry, maybe yeah. the microphone is uh, too, so too he close. So just saying like, uh, this person was uh, taken over to the Soviet side. Mark he in prison, yeah. And he felt like he, he became more Polish by being over there. Um, so can you comment on kind of the complexity of yeah. you know, the Polish-Soviet-Jewish relationship? Yeah, Mar 
Mark Olin wrote the memoir in uh, Russian. I, I uh, read it. There, the, the Chekhov publishing house published a shortened version, and then there was a longer version. Yeah, I mean, to add the, to the complexity, of course, many Polish Jews love Poland. But, you know, but that's, that's a subject of, of, of another hour's lecture. <laughs> now, after the war, uh, about 1,500 Jews were murdered in Poland after the war. Uh, in uh, Kelts on July 4th, 1946, 42 Jews were killed in a pogrom. Uh, Jews were hauled off trains and murdered. There was a civil war between the nationalist underground and the new communist government. One of the mantras was that the Jews are all communists. If we, you know, make sure the Jews don't stay in Poland, then the communists won't have a social base. And so while some Polish Jews after the war felt, okay, we can rebuild a life here, in 1946 there was a mass stampede out of Poland. Uh, that's my, my parents left Poland in September 46. I was born two weeks later in uh, Germany. Uh, so whatever f love affair there remained with Poland, uh, was put to a great test by what happened in 45, 46. And I would say that uh, Polish-Jewish relations got even worse after World War II. Uh, and they have remained complicated. The last Polish government, the PIS government, uh, f promoted what it called, uh, in Polish, uh, polityka historyczna, uh, a historical policy basically saying, Poles, stop apologizing. We're a great people. You know, heroism in Warsaw, Monte Cassino, the Battle of Britain, the Warsaw Uprising, and we're sick of Jews trying to tear us down. We did what we could, uh, and you know, get off off, uh, off the floor and stand tall. So that previous government began to emphasize all the poles who helped Jews. This became the great narrative. It swept under the rug the what happened after World War II. Uh, the government that we have now is a different government, we'll see what happens. Now, as I said, I worked in the Poland Museum for some time. The previous government forced the director to quit because the director had an exhibit about 1968, which was a vicious anti-Semitic campaign where most remaining Jews had to leave Poland. So in other words, the jury is, is still out. Uh, but, one last thing I'd like to say, which is that uh, by some irony, in Europe today, Jews feel much safer in Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Lithuania than they do in France, Ireland, Germany, or England because of the ripples coming out of the Middle East. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jennifer Putnam and Dr. Sam Casal. Thank you, and um, they will be outside at the book signing station. Please be back for our final session of the day at 425 on our latest thank special so exhibition, Even Fighting so for the easy. Right to Fight. 425, thank you. I was going to ask if you would sign these for me. Sure.